And good morning, everyone. And welcome to Kilmore Church. Uh, once again, I'd like to welcome Reverend Higgins today to the pulpit. We look forward to hearing your word. Uh, Mark will be returning later this week, but in the meantime, if you need the service of a minister, you can contact me, and my details are on the church website or on the church annual report. The only other announcement is for anyone who's attending the outing to Let's Go Hydro this Saturday, if you can be there for 2.30, that will allow us to start on time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the welcome. It's great to be back, but this, I think, is my, well, it's the last time of this time. Hear the call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We're here to worship a wonderful God. Don't come as slaves. Come as those made free in Christ Jesus. Don't come as the unworthy. Come as invited guests of our Lord. Come as the joyful. Come as the eager. Come as the thankful. Come as the recipients of amazing grace. Let's stand together as we praise God singing, I cast my mind to Calvary. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus
Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father God, we, we come to worship you because you're the creator, the creator of all there is. You're the source of all our blessings. You, Father, are the Alpha and the Omega. And God, we are forever grateful for your love that's been poured out over us. You, Lord, are the lover of all and the judge of all. And we come to you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts. Because not only are you all powerful, but you're a merciful God. And you're a graceful God. And therefore it's to you that we come with our confession. We come Lord and we, we confess. We confess with shame that such things as discord and, and factions exist within our faith communities. We come Lord and we confess that we feel miserably when we try on our own to live lives that have been shaped by your love and your joy and your peace. We come, Lord, and we confess our failures. Our failure to seek the, uh, the empowerment of your Holy Spirit. When we are confronted daily with the challenges of following Jesus, Lord, we need your power. Lord, we come, we consider the cost that's, that's set on discipleship. And we confess that so often we fail to meet that cost. Lord, we realize the sin that has kept us from truly knowing you. And we come and we, Lord, we plead for forgiveness. And we come to you now in that moment of silence. And we confess those secrets that nobody knows. That secret sin. And we come, Lord, to repent. So, Father, we ask that you hear our prayer. Father, forgive us. Father, grant that this time may be one in which we honour your name. In Jesus' name we ask that you sustain us, that you give us all, that you give us eternal joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear this assurance. God does not expect us to be perfect. God calls us simply to do our best. And what a wonderful gift it is to know that even when we fall short, God still loves us and calls us children of the Most High. Confessing our sins, we find that healing. We find that hope. All in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our scripture reading this morning, we're back. The first week we looked at the first chapter and we were looking at the goal of faith. And then we looked last week at, are we sure 
that we've taken that step. And this week, we're sort of looking at what it's going to be like at the end time. What we're going to come up against when the sky goes black. Listen to the scripture reading, 2 Peter 3, verses 8 to 18. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that your Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which, is, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray for others. Let's come to the Lord with our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, help us to look down the road, to keep this present moment with all its troubles and all its joys in context. To remember that Christ is coming just as surely he came the first. Help us, Lord, to look forward in hope and to live now in peace. Father God, we have entered into another time. We've come to another service. And we pray, Lord, that you make it for us a time of true blessedness. A time in which we pray and share your love with others. A time in which we turn to your word and speak hope to those who are in despair. A time in which we stand with heads high and our hands out to help others, just to help those find meaning in a world that has, that has simply gone mad. We pray, Father, that, that you would move in the lives of those who feel that, that no light can shine in their darkness. In the hearts of those who are depressed in mind and spirit, and Father, in the bodies of those souls, those who are sick and suffering, Father, those who are alone. 
And we ask, Lord, that you be too with those who are oppressed, those who are afflicted, simply because they bear your name. And we ask, Lord, that you be with those, all those who suffer unjustly in this world. Father, we also come and we also pray that you would bless those whom, whom we hold especially before you today. Those who are burdens on our hearts. And we ask, Lord, that you lift up those, those folk as we bring them before you now. So, Lord, in that moment of silence, Hear our prayer for those close to us. Lord, all these things that we have prayed and, and all that we will pray, we pray to you, O God. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, he who has died and who has risen, he who will come again, we pray glory be to his name. Amen. We're going to worship once more as we stand and sing before the throne of God above.
Let's pray. God of all ages, we look for the coming of your kingdom. We await the coming of our king. Father, help us to hear his word. Just as to become children of light and to be servants of justice. May today not find us sleeping in sin. For we ask these things in his name. Christ Emmanuel. Amen. Amen. So, so what is to come? What is to come? You know, any time a person begins to talk about the end of the world as we know it, they risk being dismissed as a lunatic. And you see, with that in mind, I'm telling you this morning, we are going to look. Uh, we are going to look and talk about the end of the world, but we're going to try to avoid that lunatic fringe. You know, our goal this morning is not not to be sensational, but just to be faithful. Just to be faithful to the teachings of Scripture. We're not seeking headlines. We're seeking growth. And Peter, Peter's already told us that we should not misunderstanding this delay in the return of the Lord. We must remember that all God has to do is say the word and the end will be upon us. And he also reminded us the, that the seeming delay should, not be, should be seen really as an act of mercy. And that's giving people more opportunity to come to him. Now, having said this, he wants us to understand what is to come and what the implications of these truths should be for the way that we live our lives. You know, what we know about what is coming, we find it there in verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heaven will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It will be unexpected. You know, when we think about it, no one ever expects their house to catch fire. Well, unless they're doing something illegal. Or have their home destroyed by a tornado. We don't know. You can't anticipate being mugged or being robbed. And even though we know all these things could happen to us, when they actually do happen, we're caught by surprise. And Peter says this is what it's going to be like with the return of Christ and with that final judgment. And Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 24. Jesus said, no one knows the day of the hour. People will be eating and people will be drinking and they will live in life like they've always did. And then suddenly the end. And Jesus said anyone who can appear can appear to be ready if they know what's going to happen. But the person who is truly faithful is the one who is ready for the coming of the Lord. Just whenever it takes place. Do you know, whenever it takes place, it's going to be devastating. Throughout the Bible, there are references to the heavens disappearing and the moon and the stars darkening and, and much, much more. Jesus says, immediately in Matthew 24, verse 29, he says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Is God going to destroy all of creation and then start over again? Or is it merely going to feel like that? Is it merely going to feel like everything's destroyed? Is scripture's description a literal description? Or is it a figurative description? Is Peter using a figure of speech like, when we complain, I was up all night, meaning that we had trouble sleeping? 
or you know that the the fog the fog was so thick that I could have cut up with a knife meaning visibility was poor you know the question that I would really like to ask is does it really matter does it really matter whether it's literal or figurative the point is when the day of the Lord comes the judgment will be devastating and the end of that verse 10 is a little tough for me to understand. You know, that last phrase, listen, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The ESV translation says, it's more, it's more literally translated, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. You see, in other words, there will be no place to hide. Think about it, the pretending will be over. The truth will come out. Again, either option is devastating there, and there will be two responses. And the first response is one of terror. Isaiah, Isaiah tells the story in Isaiah 6 of seeing this grand vision of God. And Isaiah's response wasn't to say, hey, that was cool. That's cool, man. No, he turns around and he says, woe is me, for I am undone. Perhaps we would say, sure, I'm a dead man. You see, to stand before God with our sin fully exposed, that'll convince us of how deserving we are of the judgment. All our secret sin will be exposed. No secrets. All our pious little excuses and all our rationalizations will be all shown for what they are, an unwillingness to obey God. Our half-truths, you know those half-truths that we tell, they're going to be seen as lies which twist the truth. All our distractions will be seen clearly as the worship, the worship of false gods, idolatry. Our self-centeredness and indifference to others, they're going to be seen as a lack of justice and a lack of mercy. This reality calls us to repent of our sin and to share the gospel with others. You see, if we really do care about the people that we claim to care about, we'll encourage them in this area of genuine discipleship. And we'll do it now. And you know where it starts? It starts in our own families. We want our children to learn how to work hard and how to study well and how to make all the wise decisions. We don't want them to want for anything. And we teach them that, we teach them what it is to be a family. We teach them what to look for. We teach our daughters what to look for in someone to date. We even work with them on, on hygiene and diet. And you know, these are all good things. However, the vital question is, what are you doing to prepare your children for the day of judgment? You see, the longer we wait to train our children in godliness, the less likely they'll embrace the way of Christ. And if we really don't get the right balance, we'll raise nice, plate little boys and girls. We'll raise lovely, talented children who'll spend their eternity in hell. This is a true story. I just discovered this while I was looking for an illustration. But this is true. On December the 7th, 1941, the American forces at Pearl Harbor were caught off guard. An army radar operator saw blips on the screen and he reported them to an officer and he said, something's coming. And the officer said, it's probably just a pigeon with a metal band around its leg. This was when the planes were still 50 minutes away. Plenty of time to prepare for the attack. Because the, advance, because the advance warning was ignored, eight battleships, 
three light cruisers were sunk, 220 planes were destroyed or severely damaged, and most importantly, 2,300 men were killed. Peter is giving us the advance warning that we need. The real question is, will we heed the warning? Or will we dismiss it as nothing to worry about and then be caught by surprise, just like the American forces, and vulnerable? There will be one other response to this day of judgment. And that, I'm glad to say, is going to be rejoicing. Peter says there, verse 13, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You see, for the believer who has lived in a state of readiness, the day of final judgment, it's not a day of terror. It's going to be a day of joy. We'll be cleansed finally and fully from all our sin. The world will be rid of all that evil, all that destructive. The devil and his army will be cast into the pit of hell forever. We'll be reunited with our, with our loved ones who have died in Christ and we'll get to, to meet and we'll get to worship the Son of God in person. Whoa, what a day that's going to be. We'll receive our resurrected bodies. We'll be set free to live the life that God really created us to live. You see, for the true follower of Christ, his second coming will be the realization of our hope. That day will be the day when faith, when our faith becomes sight. And it will be the greatest joy that we've ever imagined. So, question. How should we prepare? Well, verse 11 says this. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Listen. You ought to live holy and godly lives. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Practice holiness. That's what we do. We practice holiness and godliness. We change the way we live by being holy and godly. What does it mean to be holy? Well, it means to be set apart. It means that we are devoted to God for him to use us as he sees fit. To be godly means to reflect, to reflect on the character of God, for God to be seen in your life, to represent God in this world. Peter tells us that those who live this way help achieve God's purposes, not only here in the world, but it also speeds up his coming. You know, in 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 31, Paul was talking about the importance of living faithfully before the Lord. And he writes this, listen. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. Can you see, can you see that this is just the opposite approach that we sinners take? Can you see that? You know, when people recognize that life's short, what do they do? They indulge themselves. They indulge themselves as much as possible. They spend all their money to seek this experience of every pleasure. They try to grab all the gusto when they have, they have all the fun while they can. But you see, in this mad dash for all those sensual pleasures, what they're really doing is they're squandering the opportunity to serve the Lord and to lay up for themselves treasures in heaven. 
let's do a little exercise. I don't mean we're going to stand up and jig about a bit. Not that kind, not the kind that makes us sweat. Imagine that in the next moment, the Lord called an end to everything. Time's up. The judgment's about to begin. Now imagine that you're standing in line and you're waiting for your moment before the king. Ask yourself some questions. Ask yourself, what stuff would you like to hide? What stuff would you like deleted from your hard drive? What do you wish you had done and not put off? Who will you wish you had told about the Lord Jesus? What favorite excuses are now going to sound empty and stupid? What activities are going to appear to have been a complete waste of time? You know, folk, this is not just a fun exercise. There is coming a day when this is really going to happen. And we're ways to prepare for that day. And Peter follows this up and he says in verse 14, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Now, I'm a wee bit intrigued by the word spotless and blameless. Because I don't know about you, but I think I live too much of my life trying to be good enough. Or trying to be better than those around me. You see, I tend to live, you know, like the athlete. He's happy to be just as good as those around him, rather than putting in the extra time or extra training to be the best. You see, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices that were brought to God by the people had to be spotless, and they had to be without blemish. God just had to get the best. And it was only a perfect sacrifice that could pay for your sin. Paul says in Romans 12, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, can you see it? We're living sacrifices. We're to present ourselves to God and no longer conform to the evil of this world. And there, there's a saying, I, re, I was in the TA many years ago, and there was a saying in the TA, the more you sweat in training, the less you'll bleed in battle. In the case of faith, the more diligently you follow Christ now, the less regret later. Peter also tells us to pursue peace with God. So how do you do that? Well, we come to him with open hearts for salvation. We come to him for new life. We come humbly acknowledging that, that we do not and cannot earn his favor. We said this the first week and we said it the second week and we said this week and probably Mark will say it next week. Are you going to listen? We come humbly acknowledging that we do not and cannot earn his favor. We put our hope and our trust in the work of Jesus. We spend much time with Jesus in prayer. We, we spend much time pondering his word. We learn to rest in his wisdom. We trust his promises. We say it every week. God's peace is available to us. We must learn to live in that peace. You know, it's amazing to read the stories 
of those who have been to war. I'm a war freak. I read them all the time. And they endured great hardship. They go without sleep. They see horrible things, but they keep going. They keep moving forward because they believe the battle is worth fighting for. And even when they they don't know for sure why they're fighting, they believe in those who lead the way. They believe in their country. They believe that the war, that when the war is over, they'll have really some some done some good. Do you see how we need that same kind of attitude? You see, this spiritual battle is being fought every day of our lives. Do you see how we need this attitude? There's coming a day when the world as we know it is going to come to a, conclu- uh, to come to a conclusion, come to a close. But that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story in so many ways. It's only the beginning. And Peter calls us to fight, to persevere, to keep, keep going now because in the end we will we'll have been used by God to make a difference. We'll have fought the battle. Peter doesn't spend a lot of time talking about signs. He doesn't talk about signs of the Lord's coming. His approach to the second coming of the Lord is not academic at all. It's passionately practical. He states the truth of scripture and then he asks the question that we should all ask in the light of this truth, how then should I live? And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to take some time to think about these things and ask that hard question. What if today's the day? What if today's the day that he gives the command? Friends, remind yourself that he said it would be sudden. He said it would be unexpected. And instead of putting these thoughts off to the end of your life or the end of the life you picture, I think you should think about it now. About it right now. Please. Please think about it now. You know, for some of us, We have been putting off beginning a real relationship with Christ because, quite frankly, we just want to have a wee bit of fun first. Yet what you call fun, God calls foolish delusion. You see, sin is pleasant. And sin is pleasant for a season. But holiness and contentment and joy and peace, they're eternal. You know, I remember, I'll never forget, I remember as a boy, one Christmas I got a train set, an electric train set, and I had great pleasure with it, but I wanted an air gun, and I wanted an air gun so I could have fun shooting the cat next door that kept trying to get to my pigeon. And I thought it was a great trade until I got caught shooting the cat. And I can tell you, my bottom hurt more than the cats did. And I finished up with no air gun and no train set. You know, sadly, many people are leading their lives this way. They think they're choosing the better and the more exciting option. They're making a good trade. But in truth, they're trading their life of peace and joy and a walk with the Lord. They're trading it for a handful of sand. Most people on their deathbed look back wishing they had used their time better. And the only way to avoid that in our lives is is to take the action now. For those of us who have trusted Christ for forgiveness and new life, this text is a reminder, keep kicking. 
It's so easy for the novelty of faith to wear off. But you see, following Christ is not like the other amusements of our lives. Discipleship is not a sprint. Discipleship's a marathon. And our challenge is to keep training. To keep building up our spiritual stamina. There is a battle to be fought. There's a war to be won. Because the day of judgment is coming. And there are some bad things on the horizon. However, those who follow, those who follow faithfully die. Those who have Christ now will not be afraid when that time comes. Instead, we're going to look forward with great joy. Picture it. We're going to look forward with great joy to just floating towards the pearly gates. That's what thinking about it now leads to. Free ride to heaven. There's another option, but heaven's preferred. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as so many days seem aimless and, and the wait seems, just seems eternal. I would pray that you would energize us to live holy, godly lives. Lives that please you. And Father, may those who are yet looking for ultimate meaning, may they find comfort in all that we do and all that we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to bring our service to conclusion singing Amazing Grace. But it's that other version, isn't it? My chains are gone.
of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Go in peace. And may the Prince of Peace dwell within your hearts and bless you with wholeness that he died to give you. May his resurrection power fill you and make your lives new. And may his peace shine forth from you and bring blessing to all whom your lives touch. This both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.